So investigations and referrals. So, you know, we do need to do some investigations to rule out any organic disorder. But then this is the really hard part, and I struggle with this, is knowing where to draw the line. And it can be easier said than done if they've got a lot of increasing somatic symptoms. And for things like, say, abdominal pain, which we talked about before, I can get away with some bloods, sometimes an x-ray and ultrasound, and that's about it. So I explain why we're not doing more invasive investigations. I really talk up the risk of adverse consequences, radiation, everyone's scared of radiation, so that's great. So GA risk <laughs> as well. <laughs> and the studies that show that the chance of finding, this is an abdo abdominal pain, any pathological process is very low. Unfortunately, things like recurrent headaches may need an MRI if it's a short history. Uh, musculoskeletal pain, often you have to do a full blood count, inflammatory markers, ANA. But the one I'm sort of struggling with a bit at the moment, and we're seeing a few referrals for this, is questioning if their kid's chronic pain or various other issues are due to Ehlers-Danlos. So for Ehlers-Danlos, there's a set of criteria, uh, Baton criteria, I think it is. But if the parent's pushing it in the examination of not is not supportive, I tend to use the get out of jail free clause, which is a second opinion. Um, I haven't had to do it for a while, but I was just talking to one of you guys before about a patient that's going to uh, having to see in September. But if I'm really pressured to do invasive investigations that I don't feel justified, I always refer them for a second opinion. So I'm a bit of a believer of the mana hierarchy in medicine. So I'm kind of mid-range, and the tertiary people are top of the top of the pile. So that's why I, you know I like a second opinion. And it's also important to note though doctor shopping so this is something I get really worried about um, luckily for us there's not a huge private sector in paediatrics and also most adult doctors will never see a child they freak out there's a couple of exceptions to the rule I do do some work in private and I and if I see a referral for a patient with chronic pain and I go through their public records. Luckily in Auckland all the three DHBs are all on the same system so I can see who they've been seeing. I just say I don't want to see them unless you know unless they are going to accept that basically it's a one-off opinion to enforce to the family to stay in the public sector because this stuff is best managed in the public sector I feel. Um, so if you do refer anyone to private it's really good really good idea to, to talk about what's already been done, particularly in the public sector, because you know we just don't we just don't feel it serves the patient any good to go around multiple different people. And the other issue with doing more and more investigations is that, and it's particularly the case with Joanna as well, is that a focus continues to be maintained on maintained on what finding out what is wrong as opposed to getting involved in the rehabilitation process. So sometimes I've got to say to parents, look, I know you're worried about what's going on, but we've <coughs> done these normal investigations. We won't close our mind off, but we still at the same time need to do the rehabilitation process. Things won't get better. So I'm just going to go to another case. So Sam, so she's a Sam girl I saw in outpatient. So she's an 11 year old girl, high academic achiever. She was very busy, gymnastics, skiing, athletics, social netball, and she had an athletics shoe spike injury, and then she had a minor sprain. She went to an urgent doctor, he x-rayed it, it was normal, they strapped it. In the next few weeks she had increasing pain and some swelling. Several trips to GP, but different GPs each time, went back to the urgent doctor who kindly put her in a moon boot, which we never thrilled about. Unfortunately, the next few weeks she got increasing pain and redness in her foot. Her foot was cold at times, it's summer in Auckland. Went back to her GP, saw a normal family GP who referred her through to a private paediatric orthopaedic surgeon who thankfully diagnosed her with a condition called CRIPS and referred her to, through to General Peds. So she saw me in clinic. Mm -hmm. So for, for Sam, it was a, obviously a careful history and examination, also a heads. Thankfully, the orthopod had already done the investigations, had done an MRI, <coughs> X-ray, bloods, all of which were normal. And the HEADS assessment revealed she, she had a lot of internal pressure. She was a high achiever, just started a new school, new peer group. It was pretty academically challenging, and she wanted to go to the New Zealand Nationals Athletics. So parents that I said to me, we don't put the pressure on her, but there's a kind of one of these very driven young people. And there was also a positive family history, 
father had anxiety, granny had had a fibromyalgia. So in these situations, the introduction of chronic pain in Crips can be a bit challenging because Crips has a lot of visual changes. You know, they look horrendous, these foots. They're usually purple, red or swollen and cold. And it's hard to, for people to get their head around that this is a chronic pain process as opposed to something that's wrong with the hardware. So I tend to be fairly frank with people and, and, and I say, look, this is a really difficult concept to understand, but for most of us, pain is something is wrong and we should rest until it gets better, which is fine if you've had a sprained ankle yesterday, but not if this is ongoing. And this was a couple of months, really, of history by the time it got to see me in clinic. But we know in this situation that if you rest, the pain will paradoxically get worse. And if we can't do anything fun or nice with pain, we get very down about the pain and can't do our usual activities. Has this happened to you? So usually, hopefully, they say yes. And then what I tend to do is then segue into the science of the pain, the ongoing potentiation of the pain, and the use of the burglar and acoustic guitar analogies. It's kind of simplistic. But I find if they take on board this and they accept this, then they tend to see why we want to do a rehabilitation process. And it's hard work. I mean, you know, we know it does work, but the rehabilitation is hard work. And I, I sort of really kind of say to them, we, we've got a holistic accept, approach of acceptance of the pain process has occurred, no fault of your own. But because of this pain process, we need to work and Crips is the one where we're really keen on input from a physio to desensitise your foot and to turn off this electric guitar process. And then if the electric guitar is turned off, then very gradually the burglar alarm will dampen down. And by use of, and I explained to them, by use of mobilisation, because it's the last thing we want to do, because their foot really hurts, it acts to tell our brain that these alarm signals are false and that we need to turn them off and get, and get moving again. Also getting back to school, sleeping better, and sometimes medication can be helpful, but it's never the sole answer, and I just kind of cross my fingers that the family accept this. So I was lucky with this family. They were really embracing. The father had actually gone through a similar rehabilitation approach with his anxiety management and the mother who worked in the corporate world just been to a WorkSafe seminar about rehabilitation so they were kind of on board. And they were, uh, I saw them at, at Starship and, and but it was quite helpful, they had money which was good. So basically they booked private physio, private psychologist and by the end of the day they emailed me, they'd booked a physio, appointment with a psychologist, arranged a meeting with the school, this is not entirely normal, to be honest, to be that proactive, but I was really thrilled. Um, the school were incredibly supportive, they often are. Um, I was very keen on daily walking once she had some desensitisation with a physio in the foot. And she's someone who I did use some medication on. And the big thing was a lot of education. The science of the chronic pain, I provide heaps of information sheets and I'll give you the references for those and the use of those analogies. The follow-up was pretty easy actually because things did improve steadily for this kid. She was really resistant because you know when you've got a cold extremely painful foot the last thing you want to do is people to touch it and move her. But she was back to school for several hours a day within, within about a month. By about six weeks she's walking some short distances and starting to talk about athletics. I saw her for a further three more times and after the third follow-up I discharged her with a weaning plan on the medication. Her mother's emailed me, she's had a couple of relapses but that was entirely managed by the GP and the family just reinstating the rehab approach again. So, you know, it was, it was a nice, simple-ish sort of thing. So, I don't know if you've seen Crips or, yeah, some are nodding, some are nodding, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's not common in children, but it does occur. Um, I've seen a few, couple of patients in outpatients, but also a few in inpatients, and there's often a bit of a diagnosis delay because it's not particularly common or expected in children. Um, they t tend to mainly be the feet. I've n ever seen it, in, I've never seen it in hands in children. I've only ever seen it in feet. I don't know, in adults, I think it can occur in hands mainly. Yeah, I've, there can be a minor trauma or fracture, 
fractures are about 5 to 14% of the triggers in CRIPS. Surgical procedure, 10 to 15%. It's predominantly girls. I've never seen a boy with CRIPS. I presume they do occur. You have, oh no, no one's sort of scratching their head. Uh, mean age is about 12. And the duration of symptoms prior to diagnosis is usually quite long, a number of months. And obviously there's a lot of rates of school and home distress as well preceding the onset. I mean, I look to try and find out what's the cause of it. I reread all the stuff. I mean, there's a lot of various thoughts, but bottom line is no one really knows. You know, there's various functional MRI studies, but I'm kind of a bit dubious about functional MRI. I think, like, you know, different studies say different things. But probably it's fair to say that their brains respond differently to normal stimuli. It's thought to be a small muscle polyneuropathy, but in other patients not. Possibly of activation of the immune system. Possibly some genetic associations, but bottom line, no clear-cut cause. Um, and the symptoms are constant pain. They often talk about burning or stabbing, throbbing, increases with movement. So when you start to say, I want you to move your foot, you can see why the kids are really resistant. They often have a lot of allodynia. If it goes on for a long period of time, muscle weakness or atrophy, I've not really seen that. But lots of autonomic changes. I mean, this kid's foot was swollen, and it was red, it was cold, and it was Auckland in summer. So yeah, so they, they look dramatic, and that can really reinforce that anxiety that, you know, it looks like something as bad is happening. So... They do need to investigate, as there can be some um, organic conditions as well. But the main differential is orthopaedic, um, I suppose rheumatological issues as well, said to be leukaemia, spinal cord tumours, but you usually image the blood. So you can kind of, those basic bloods, x-rays, MR. And the main treatment is physiotherapy and CBT. The physiotherapy is focused on reinstating movement in the affected limb, which is the last thing that people want to do. But it starts with a graded process. So one of my friends is a physiotherapist at the chronic pain team, and they often use shaving foam, which is really good. And, I'll exp and I've had experience in that, so I'll tell you about that later. But cotton wool, just gradually desensitizing, then gradual stretching, then onto weight bearing and progressing up. The psychologist is kind of more around teaching the patient's CBT things to, about pain and catastrophizing, also parent coaching as well. And medications, whilst they use the kind of, and they, they always end up on medications, but this is another thing about the physiotherapy type of thing. But the medications, there's not a huge amount of trials. Like even in adults, I was kind of surprised. Um, for us in peds, they always end up in paracetamol and non-steroidals. We often end up with amitriptyline and gabapentin, which I'll talk about. Um, and sometimes some really difficult ones in the chronic pain team use ketamine uh, as well, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and, you know, things like nerve blocks were used a number of years ago, but um, they weren't really helpful. I mean, I was pretty shocked by the lack of studies, to be honest, because, you know, Crips is one of those things I can end up with on a lot of medications, and someone was talking about uh, how much medications they can occur on. But like I said, trials, small numbers, variable quality. There was only one trial I could find in children in Crips of everything. Everything is adult. Um, and that one trial was comparing amitriptyline and GABA, but it was open label, no controls, four weeks. And that was it. So it's a kind of evidence-free zone, to be fair. Um, so for us, we tend to use amitriptyline to help with sleep as well. Often they end up in gabapentin, and sometimes, occasionally, they need ketamine. So looking at it in more detail, so amitriptyline, it's no studies. <laughs> It's thought to act to de dampen down that, to or sorry, to augment that descending inhibition. But it can prolong QT interval. There can be anticholinergic side effects. Can be associated with serotonin syndrome if there's SSRIs as well. And we tend to use a starting dose really tiny in peds, so 10 milligrams, and can be increased to 20 after two to four weeks. I I do an ECG prior to starting medication, and again about two weeks later. 
um, to assess the QT interval. I'm a bit paranoid about those things. I never used to talk about this, but I'm probably going to start talking about this with families a lot more, about discontinuing these medications, because there's a lot of stuff in the media recently. I read a lot of UK papers, because I used to live over there, and um, there's been a lot of stuff about the issues around trying to get off these medications. It's more around SSRIs. But I'm certainly going to incorporate this in my counselling about sometimes the issues around getting off medications. One of my buddies is one of the psychiatrists at Starship and, and she, her sort of practice is if it hasn't improved after four weeks she weans it off rather than because often they can end up for you know weeks or months or years on this stuff. And there's no evidence around the use of SSRIs and CRIPS unless they're depressed. Uh, gabapentin there's three small trials in adults only, and they're mainly in neuropathic pain, short duration, some improvement in pain symptoms. It's thought to bind to those voltage-gated calcium channels. So remember, going back to the science, we're thought to reduce the excitatory neurotransmitters, such as um, glutamate. But it can cause a lot of side effects. I've had a few patients have had a lot of problems, dizzy, nausea, fatigue, those type of things. And again, it's one of those things they can end up for a long period of time and no one thinks to try to wean them off it. So ketamine, um, so NMDA receptor antagonist, remember back to the science that was involved in the spinal cord. Again, some pilot open label studies. It's an infusion, it's a hospital setting only. So I kind of, I'm skeptical. I always think the placebo effect must be really strong in ketamine because there's that placebo hierarchy and that. I'm not entirely convinced from what I see because I see these patients coming back again and again and again. Um, and again, I kind of worry about, not worry, but I think to myself, is it taking the eye off the ball off all the other stuff? But these are the really tricky patients. Thankfully not dealt with by me, by the chronic pain team. So what tends to happen for these guys with CRIPS is paracetamol non-steroidal often amitriptyline, sometimes, and or melatonin, often gabapentin, and for the really resistant cases, the ketamine in the hospital setting. Um, but most mild cases like Sam, I was able to manage her entirely as an outpatient, but for the really sick, the hard, tricky ones, we often find we do admit them to start the multidisciplinary process to avoid the wait lists for psychology and, and physio input in the community. But like I said with the other ones, it's a time limited of admission like with Joanna. So clear goals and total family engagement. So kind of, you know, but that's all very well in the hospital. What can you do in outpatients as well? So in chronic pain in general, there's this thing called the 4S approach that we really like. And because we're simple folks in general peds, we keep things really simple. So this is something that you can use for all forms of chronic pain disorders, and I reckon the functional disorders as well. So 4S is approach to helpful to remember the management priorities. I love my sports and exercise, so everyone gets prescribed walking. I think, you know, we evolved as humans, we walked. It gets us out of the house. I love it when they've got a dog, because, you know, the dog has to go walking as well. And it, it, we, we get to socialise with other dog walkers or other walkers, we get a bit of a vitamin D and it kind of tells our brain that actually things are okay. If they can't walk because they've got crips, then you know you do need a physiotherapist to help with that side of things. The kids I really struggle with is if the parents have decided to rent a wheelchair, I don't know, you know, and, and, that, and that's really hard and they, often I find we just have to admit those kids to kick start the rehab, but it's not common. Sleep's a really important one to kind of actively get a good history about and to manage. It's a really good form of torture, as any new parent will tell you. It leads to a lot of negative thoughts and mood. And, you know, going through the sleep hygiene strategies. Um, there's a really good website, raisingchildren.net.au. It's Australian, but it has all the list. There's good sections on each aspect of childhood and, and a really good sleep um, section. So I always limit electronics one hour prior to bed, and that's for everyone in the family. I say everyone's electronics. Um, sleeping in a cool, dark room. Melatonin can be helpful. Amitriptyline may be helpful. Um, social contacts, another thing I prescribe. 
So I'm really surprised at how really socially isolated these chronic pain patients can get. The world gets busy, people move on. And I know this generation are different, like, you know, they're all in their electronic communication and that. But again, we evolved to face-to-face -face communication. So what I tend to say to the parents of the kid out of the room, if possible, I say, look, can you get the kid's friends to come round unannounced? Because they'll say, oh, why don't you come, why don't your friend come round? They, oh, no, I don't want to. But if they come round unannounced, then they don't have a choice. School is non-negotiable. So we have a really good um, service um, called the Northern Health Schools. Auckland and uh, teachers that go to the home, liaise with the school, liaise with us, that type of thing. But I'll only, but we have to have a certificate to, to access that service. So I'll only provide a certificate for one term at a time and only if the child, child is actually getting to school. So I, no way do I want the kid to be schooled at home. Um, if the parent refuses to get the child to school, then I refuse to do a Northern House School certificate and then the truancy gets involved. I haven't had to do that yet, but a couple of my colleagues have. We don't want them to these kids to be homeschooled. It, it, they just end up incredibly socially isolated and several students and my colleagues have had really terrible outcomes. So, I mean, obviously there's some kids who are homeschooled who don't have health issues who are absolutely fine, you know. But if they've got health issues, you know, they've got to get to school. And what we do if they've been off school for some time, like Joanna and Sam, that we grade it back to them and, and graded approach to restart school. So I always say to parents, I'm not really that bothered about the academic side of things, to be honest. I'm really keen for them to be part of the break time, whether it be morning tea or lunch, and maybe in one class. So sometimes it's one hour a day or two hours a day, but it's Monday to Friday, so it's consistency. I'm not keen on Monday, Wednesday, Friday or whatever. And sometimes it's only several weeks, but sometimes it's a term, and then, but with clear goals to grade that up. Schools are incredibly supportive in this situation. I'm always really surprised by it. Even schools like Grammar have been very supportive. Um, and they've been really helpful and they're flexible and they really have worked hard to accommodate the students. They often have great counselling services, so that helps. Um, usually what happens, the dean takes the things. A number of schools have employed a buddy system to help the student get with attendance, which has been fantastic. So the whole kind of thing is function. So function has to occur before pain resolution. And I really stress that. And I stress around the central nervous system has to be de-escalated. And hopefully this results in improvement of fear avoidance, pain anxiety behaviours. But it's the most challenging part. And after the first consultation, I never ask them about the pain again. I never, you know, they come to see me in clinic and it's always about what are you doing, how often are you getting to school, getting out and walking the dog, you know, that, how's your sleep? I don't ask them how their pain is. Just, you know, thanks. They might bring it up, but I <laughs> ignore it. So, again, going back to medication, I kind of think of it as a bridge. So it's a bridge to hopefully get them moving. I tend to be fairly realistic to parents about the evidence, which is pretty rubbish. Um, and, but kind of part of me thinks if I'm a bit too honest about the lack of evidence, it might interfere with the placebo effect, which we all know is pretty good. So, amitriptyline and gabapentin seem to be the mainstays for most forms of chronic pain. And then they can help with sleep, which is often impaired. So. So looking at the general medications for the different types of you know, chronic pain, so for abdominal pain, we often use amitriptyline. Sometimes SSRIs are used. I don't use them, but some of my colleagues might if the, the, they feel the kid's depressed. And remember going back to the functional abdo pain things, the, there is a higher rate of depression, particularly amongst teenage girls. All the other stuff that used to be used in the past, like buscopan, periactin, acid depressants, prokinetics, are all pretty rubbish, to be honest, and generally not used. I suddenly thought to myself, my God, I don't have anything about medications for headaches, so I put in some windsurfing pictures, because I went windsurfing in the weekend, because we actually had some winds. So, um, but the keen people will notice that is not Auckland in August, so that is Maui in July. <laughs> but even with things like headaches, 
you know, there can be a lot of medication use, particularly analgesics. We do often use amitriptyline for the chronic <coughs> headache kids. Topiramate can be helpful. But the big thing is avoiding analgesic overuse. I think this is mainly more in adults, but I have seen it a little bit in, in children as well. And again, the evidence isn't that great, to be honest. Um, but the psychology, that's... And I kind of always... What I, another analogy I use to parents is that management of chronic pain is, is a little bit like the trivial pursuit counters. There's not one little wedge that's any more important than everything else. It's all additive so that's exercise and sleep and psychology and getting to school and social and and that side of things so i tend to say it's, it's really important how it's framed or perceived to be framed we focus on the evidence so the evidence for psychology is pretty good but it's also framing around the negative spiral and anxiety and, and people have asked me how to manage anxiety and i think that's really hard and these guys and I talk about psychology being part of our advanced strategies to help with you know, managing this difficult pain and, and also use the kind of thing that this is a holistic approach. People like a holistic approach. Um, so it's all part of that 4S um, process. And the problem I find that with trying to find a psychologist with paediatric pain management is hard. The wait list for us to refer to consult liaison team in public is about four to six months. We had a major problem a year, some time ago, the consult liaison team were pretty short staffed, they had huge amounts of inpatients and they actually stopped seeing our patients for a number of months. So it's all kind of very well to rec recommend a psychologist but if you've got no psychologist what do you do? Um, I'll talk a little bit later about some brief interventions in clinic that we can all do if we don't have timely access. Um, and, you know, you've probably seen these sort of things before about the uh, fear avoidance model and how pain and deconditioning and social isolation and all can also worsen these things. Most people do make a full recovery after an injury, but it's trying to prevent those going down that left-hand side of that fear avoidance molecule pathway as opposed to the right hand side I, it would be kind of good if we all if we could like you know for us as well to try and identify those guys at risk of doing that so the frequent attenders the ed event attenders if they've got depressive or anxious features and to try and start this 4s program sort of early on to help with the pain but it's always easier said than done and this is looking at the interpersonal fear avoidance from the base of a child and the interaction with the parent-child diet. And also you kind of appreciate if a parent has a lot of issues with pain, how that can escalate as well. And that's really hard. I, I don't think there's any easy answers to try and stop there, apart from the getting back to functioning.